Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Minnesota Matters. Minnesota Matters is a quarterly webinar focused on state banking issues, which we feel get ignored sometimes unfairly. Um, so these webinars are recorded and they are posted on MBA's YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and just search for Minnesota Bankers Association, you'll see all the previous ones that we've done. And then um, the one from today will be uploaded probably by the end of the day today. I'm Tess Rice, I'm MBA's general counsel. I'm joined by Teresa Kuvas, our senior government relations manager, Tom Boswell-Healy, our associate counsel and compliance consultant, and Keith Johnson, our associate counsel. Today, I'm gonna start off with an interesting uh, court decision, and then Teresa's gonna give us a summary of the legislative session that just concluded. We'll go through some bills that will impact banks, and then uh, we're gonna turn it over to Keith for a more detailed look at the new recreational cannabis law. And then uh, Tom will wind it up with an issue he gets a lot of questions about, um, refinances versus modifications and extensions. If you have any questions for any of us, just please put them in the chat and we will answer those. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with this uh, recent court decision. Um, some of you may have been, be familiar with um, Royal Credit Union's attempt to buy a Lake Area Bank. Um, so, some background on this case, in March of 2021, the Department of Commerce shared draft guidance with industry groups, including the MBA, stating that Minnesota statutes do not, do not allow a state chartered bank to sell to a credit union. That guidance never got beyond the draft stage and it wasn't distributed to financial institutions. The Department of Commerce had allowed such a transaction in 2016 when Royal Credit Union was allowed to purchase Capital Bank in St. Paul. That was under a different commissioner and a different deputy commissioner. There's not ever really been a mechanism for those transactions. There's no application form that would fit that type of transaction. So regardless of that, Royal Credit Union entered into a purchase agreement with Lake Area Bank on August 9th of 2021. And neither the bank nor the credit union sought the Department of Commerce's approval for the transaction. The bank applied directly to the FDIC, which then turned to the Department of Commerce for their opinion. And the Department of Commerce told the FDIC that the department didn't believe that it was legal under Minnesota statutes for a credit union to buy a state chartered bank. The statutes only allow a liquidation and consolidation between like financial institutions. The FDIC determined that it would not approve the transaction as long as the Department of Commerce objected. So then Royal Credit Union restructured the transaction to buy only some of the bank's assets. On September 20th of 2022, Royal Credit Union, the Minnesota Credit Union Network, their trade association, uh, Magnify Financial Credit Union and Wings Financial Credit Union filed a complaint against the Department of Commerce. In the complaint, they argued that the Department of Commerce's March 2021 guidance regarding the legality of a credit union buying a bank was inaccurate reading of Minnesota law. Uh, there was a Zoom hearing at the end of February on the Department of Commerce's motion to, to dismiss the case. So once the case was, uh, the complaint was filed, the Department of Commerce responded to that complaint and they then filed a motion to dismiss arguing that Royal Credit Union and the others did not have a case. So um, there was a Zoom hearing on that motion to dismiss at the end of February, and um, I was able to attend that. And my impression at the time was that the judge was really not impressed by the credit union's arguments. He asked why the credit unions didn't try to change the statutes at the legislature if they believed them to be unclear, unclear enough for the department to inter interpret them incorrectly. So. Last week on May 26, the, the court granted the department's motion to, dis to dismiss. The decision was based not really on a reading of the statutes, it was based on the court's lack of jurisdiction. So the court said that it lacked jurisdiction because the situation was moot since the transaction had already been restructured and was no longer pending. And the other reason was that the plaintiffs failed to exhaust their administrative remedies. 
So um, Lake Area Bank, of course, applied to the FDIC, but not to the De Department of Commerce. The Department of Commerce, the court said, should have been given the opportunity to interpret the relevant statutes. And they said that it wasn't the court's place to do that until administrative remedies have been exhausted. So they should have applied to the department. The department could have refused the application. They could have appealed that decision. And then it could have been taken to the court system. The plaintiffs also challenged uh, a couple of Minnesota statutes as unconstitutional, um, stating that they violate the due process clause for being impermissibly vague. But the court determined that the plaintiffs can't prove that the statutes are vague without an actual transaction. So this court, this court case really wasn't decided on the merits. So um, I, I know that we believe at the MBA that the statutes don't allow these transactions. Um, and it would have been interesting to see what a court thought about the actual statutes and what's allowed, but really this decision was made based on other factors. And so we don't really have uh, a solid decision here, but I do think it will be discouraging for credit unions in the future um, when they are looking at um, purchasing banks. I will put out a um, case summary of this, uh, so uh, it'll be in more detail about uh, the basis for the decision and such, so um, look for that. I'll probably get that out today or tomorrow. Okay, so that's it for the case. I'm going to turn it over to, to Teresa now to talk about our recently completed legislative session. Teresa? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, where to begin? Uh, I actually celebrated 20 years with the MBA in March, and I will have to say that this has probably been one of the most challenging in the 20 years that I worked with the MBA. You know, you go back to the financial crisis and you look at, you know, all the stuff that the um, that the financial institutions went through during that time frame, and but we had, you know, we had we had uh, Governor Pawlenty as a backstop when it came to those years. Then you go to ten years ago when the last uh, one party control of the House, Senate, and Governor's office. But back even ten years ago, there was much. There were many, many, many more moderates still at the Capitol. You had Tom Bach as the as the majority leader, and there was a lot more moderates and both parties. Fast forward to this year when you have a one party uh, one party control of all three, the House, Senate and governor's office, and you have very few moderates um, in office anymore. And you have an overwhelming, exhausting legislative session. And just to kind of even look at kind of as you know, you go back to November of last year, you end up with a 70 to 64 House majority for the Democrats. And then a 34 to 33 Senate DFL controlled majority. And that 34, you got there with a handful of Democrats winning in seats like Tom Box seat in Hastings in Detroit Lakes, where the candidates on the Republican side were not the best candidates, but the Democrats ran as much more moderates. This year, after looking at everything that passed this year, there were really no moderates. You had people that spoke about being moderates, but when it came to voting, it really was a very party line vote for majority of those bills. A $17.5 billion surplus this year wiped away very quickly. You know, 12 billion of it was one-time money that came during the COVID times, but it was wiped away. And then you started looking at what additional increases were actually put in you know, I also like to look at kind of just the last 10 years also. 10 years ago in 2013, if you read my political insight last week, 10 years ago in 2013, the state budget was $38 billion. That was the budget that they set back in 2013. Two years ago, the budget in Minnesota was $52 billion. This year, there was an increase of 38%. Our new biennial budget is going to be $72 billion. So you're jumping $20 billion. That surplus has been washed away. And now you have to figure out how to continue that, that spending. And it's not going to be pretty the next couple of years. So just kind of even forward looking, it's not sustainable. You know, we had a tax bill this year where everybody talks about $2.2 .2 billion in tax cuts. Well, that's on top of, you know, paid family medical leave passing, which is going to, you know, impact all businesses. And there's going to be, you know, the 0.7 
um, increase it with businesses. There's, you know, there was additional, you know, taxes within the tax bill. You know, a lot of people ran last year on the social security elimination, 100% elimination. That didn't happen. It was just for select few. You know, Governor Walls ran on, you know, thousand dollar rebates, rebate checks to everybody. Now it's two hundred and sixty dollars to very, you know, to those that make under seventy five thousand. I think is what the number was. Um, so you really start looking at how much was spent this year, and you know, looking back all those years, once you put a spending program in place, it's nearly impossible to take out. You know, marijuana passing is going to create an entirely new system um, with new hires and so new government workers within the, you know, within the marijuana uh, business. Paid family medical leave is going to be another whole new system that's going to have to be set up with more government workers. In the energy and jobs bill, they created this climate, you know, this Climate Innovative Finance Authority, so this green bank. So that's going to be a whole new entity in and of itself. So this year's legislature just created more, more jobs, more government, um, as I would like to say, bureaucracy. But there was a lot, you know, it was a lot going on. You know, Commerce Chair, the one thing that we were working with this year in the Senate, you know, it's an, you, you looked at past senators who were going to be, who could possibly have been Senate Commerce Chair. We ended up with Matt Klein, Senator Matt Klein from Mendota Heights, River Grove Heights area, um, which is where um, Jim Metzen was. And Jim Metzen was, you know, 10 years ago, he was the commerce chair, but he had a banking background and he was rock solid for us. Matt Klein this year had never, ever been on commerce committee. And then he became the commerce chair. He's a physician in, by trade. He it was also the vice chair on the tax committee. So he had, and then he was also on health and human services. So commerce seemed to have kind of been more kind of his kind of, you know, they put him there because he was, he had, he had the seniority, but it wasn't really his focus. So kind of, that's kind of just kind of the layout. You know, we, we can talk about the employment issues, the MBA and Tess and I talked about this yesterday. You know, we have our legislative summary that'll come out this summer. We'll have much more information on the employment issues in there. We'll probably do another webinar as we get more experts that can kind of delve into the paid family medical leave, the earn safe, safe and sick leave, and what that really means for everybody. Because I, you know, I think in the end, everybody's going to have to evaluate what they have on, um, you know, for their employees and what changes are going to have to be made to fit that mold um, that the state has now kind of made, you know the the bar so you can exceed that but you can't go below that and that will just change everybody's so human resources are going to be having to look at that you know in every every business not every business that's going to be every local government that is the schools everybody is going to be dealing with that i was on a call a couple of weeks ago and a mayor said he's like you know he goes we're going to have to do this and he goes we can raise property taxes he's like Teachers are going to have to do this and, you know, he's like, schools are going to have to do this and they are going to have to probably lay off teachers because they are going to have to figure out this money somewhere as well. You know, so also just kind of some of the quotes that I like to point out as my son's coming in very interestingly in my room, um, the tax bill, I, you know, the structure of the tax bill and just to kind of also look at what the legislature looked like this year. You know, you had Anne Rest from New Hope, who was probably one of the last moderates and very established senators. And then you had Aisha Gomez, um, fairly new, um, and who had no problem putting all kinds of taxes, the millionaire tax, you know, this, you know, combined worldwide reporting, capital gains, everything was in her bill. I was listening to one of the tax conference committees and Senator Rest sat there and they you normally two tax chairs sit together at conference committee. They were not sitting together at the conference committee. They were across the room. But Senator Rest's comment was that there was the an insatiable appetite to raise taxes in the house. And that's saying a lot. So and then one of the tweets right after session ended when Representative Gomez, the tax chair, said taxes are not about punishment. They are about care. And so it was, it's when you start looking at the 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 chairs and the, you know, the legislators that are now that are currently in the legislature, they're not the legislators of 20 years ago, not even 10 years ago. And I don't know how we get back to where it was. Um, but some of the things that the MBA worked on, um, you know, business business 
climate was awful at the at the Capitol. So, you know, you look at every single bill, the housing bill where there, you know, there's going to be 1% increase in the um, in metro tax, you know, the metro taxes, just because there's just it was it was never ending and every bill was separate. So it, it you didn't see the layering effect until you you really looked at it at the end. So, you know, a $2.2 billion cut, you know, the chambers kind of looked at, it's about $10 billion in tax increases. So, um, so with that, kind of some of the things that the MBA has been doing um, that we really did this year was in the commerce bill, it ended up in the commerce omnibus bill. Um, you know, we were able to lead the charge on part-time branch openings and also the repealing of the director's audit. Um, kind of looking at how a bill becomes a law, you know, an idea can percolate from anywhere. You know, we sit in bank advisory meetings and the director's audit thing was mentioned there. Um, but getting an idea from a little, little idea in a seed to actually growing it and enacting it and having it become law is a lot of work within the process. And especially in the environment that we're in this year. Um, so on the part-time branches, you know, we started hearing, I think last year, we got calls from you know, a representative down in um, Southwest Minnesota, um, and he was Southeast, Southeast Minnesota. Um, and he was talking about, you know, branches closing. And, you know, then there were articles about how communities are losing their branches. And we started thinking like, is there a way to kind of, you know, not have branches be open five days a week? And we started think, you know, we started working with that one. Tess and I really started having conversations with the department. Um, and what is really feasible because obviously COVID showed that, you know, branches didn't have to like the, that the full branches didn't have to always be open for full days and, you know, mobile banking has changed so much and what does it really need to look like. Um, so that was one of the, one of the ways that we started looking at that issue and then also on the directors, the appealing the directors audit, you know, it was, you know, it was an idea that was brought up and it was, you know, something that was kind of redundant. And was it really necessary? And Tess reached out to the Department of Commerce and we had conversations about that. Um, and Tess worked with the department on language. Um, one thing to note is that to work with the department and for the department to actually make a bill, to have it go through their process because they have their own bill, they start the process right now. So they are actually currently working on what they are going to work on for 2024. So they're working, and so everything has to be approved through the through the governor's office. So for us to work with them, we had to kind of do it on our own. So we worked with them to get language that they approved, um, and then I we I work with a legislator to get everything drafted. And once that bill was drafted, um, we kind of look at the environment. We, you know, I always have kind of my go-to legislators that I have. Um, run bills for us, but this year it was not going to be that way. So I went to key staff in the House and the Senate on those committees, and I kind of really talked to them. I said, who should we work with um, that, you know, I talked to them through the bill. It's non-controversial. It should be fairly simple. I shouldn't take up more than five minutes of your time. And we kind of really work with them, and they kind of say, well, who do you work well with? And kind of make sure that they, you know, that they kind of because we want the bill to be heard. We want the bill to get through the process. So they kind of work with me on who we want for, to be authors. And we get the authors on. And I think we had five authors in the house um, from all walks of life. We had like, it was like actually in the hearing, it was just like, we had more of like the, the, the progressive liberals on there. And then we had the, you know, the Republicans on there. And so having a very balanced bill, um, you know, really increases the opportunities and chances of it getting through. So we have both of those hit those bills. We get all the talking points for our authors. I, I was telling, I was like 6 a.m. the morning that the bill was going to be heard in the Senate. My author was sending me because he wanted to be fully prepared for that hearing. And then once it passed both the House and the Senate, you know, then it starts the process of getting it in these omnibus bills and following it through the omnibus bills, continuing to write letters. Um, to make sure that it stays on their radar. The department, we reached out to the department and we asked the department if they could support the bill. So they were able to support the bill after it had been through the house, but we knew that, you know, that they had no problems with it. So they got the sign off from the governor's office that they could put their, um, their seal of approval on it as well. And so it ended up in that final bill and became law. Um, and so those will both go into effect on August 1st. Um, so that's, you know, so it's, 
it's quite the process and it's not always an easy process and it's not always a first year. It sometimes can take years to get something through with how, you know, heck the special revenue fund that took us five years to get from, you know, a mistake that was made years ago to it actually being fixed five years later. It's just kind of going through those processes. Um, but kind of also in the same exact bill, we had the climate risk disclosure survey and kind of that was one we didn't want through. And that one is one that we, you know, we worked on early that was brought to us by the commerce chair. It came up as an idea back in like December. It was like, hey, we're not going to run with it this year. It's just going to be an idea. I want to float it out there. They're doing climate risk surveys for insurance companies. Like, you know, like, just think about it. We'll talk about it. That one became like, we got, we got a bill draft. Um, in March, I was doing one of my intro meetings. And in that intro meeting, which is incredibly important why I do these meetings, the, the legislator's like, oh, I have this bill. He's like, that I'm going to run with. And I, you know, sat there and said, we have concerns with it because it was a bill that was going to require banks of 500 million in assets or more to fill out this climate risk disclosure that needed to be submitted to the Department of Commerce. We had no clue what it was going to entail. And we still don't know what, completely what it's going to entail. Um, Representative Farr helped with that one a little bit. He raised a lot of concerns. They increased the limit to, you know, to one billion in assets, so it shaves it from three, from about thirty financial institutions, from bank, thirty banks to twelve. Um, but that is one that all the meetings, all the common sense, all the good, you know, everything that possibly could go into fighting that one. It was along the lines of we are doing it because we can, even though it will impact twelve banks and seven credit unions. Um, the one positive in all of this is we have the Department of Commerce, we have legislators on the floor continuously saying they will work with the MBA, they will work with banks, they will work with the credit unions to make sure that we are all, uh, that we kind of streamline and get feedback for what this disclosure survey will look like. Um, this one was really hard for me because, again, it was not good policy. It's not going to impact, it's not going to make, you know, it's not going to change the world. Um, but that is one that um, that was just because they could. And that was literally one of the meetings that we had with um, the chair was it was going to happen. It wasn't going to be voluntary. It wasn't going to be pushed out any later than July 30th of 2024, um, but it was going to be done. Um, and so that one is one that we will continue, we'll continue to work with the Department of Commerce on um, to make that as simple as we possibly can for that one. Um, one other bill that I'm going to touch base on and then I'll pass, pass back to Tess. Um, we've done, you know, property assessed clean energy. We've talked about this a lot over the years. Um, we've obviously um, limited the amount of um, there's no pro, there's no residential program, uh, but the commercial property assessed clean energy has been up and running. 15 years, I think now. Um, one thing that the Port Authority has always done when it comes to these, um, these PACE agreements is that they've always reached out to the lender to get to let them know that it's happening. Um, and so it was never in statute that they had to reach out to the lender and get sign off, but it was something that the Port Authority and others have done. Um, they keep adding more to what they want to add into the commercial PACE statute. Um, so we did specify this, you know, the last couple of years that if they were gonna to continue to open up the commercial pay statute, we wanted in writing, in statute, that a notice and written consent must be made and received from and to and from the lender um, for these commercial pays. And we understood that they were already doing it, but we know that there's always change in leadership and there's always change in these, um, in the Port Authority. And so we just wanted it to be something that was going to be done uniformly. So that was something that did get done this year in the energy and environment omnibus bill. Um, so that one um, was a success as well. So I think that's what I have for now. So Okay. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, I'm just going to add some details. The part-time branches law says that a branch can be closed for up to 48 consecutive hours at a time. So meaning you could be closed Monday, Tuesday, just be open Wednesday and closed Tuesday, Thursday, you know, so it gives you some options in scheduling. Um, I assume if you, your branch is open on a certain day, it's going to need to be open until at least two o'clock. That's what the department has been saying, uh, or at least did during COVID when banks wanted to be closed a little earlier. Um, on this, on the audit, the director's audit, um, 
that the law is effective August 1st, but the Department of Commerce has said they will not cite a bank for a violation if they do not have the director's audit between now and August 1st. So there really isn't any reason to uh, pay for a director's audit in the future. So uh, they do retain the authority to request one if they want one. So that is, there is that. Um, Another bill that passed, this was a difficult issue for us. It had to do with uh, coerced debt. So it's someone who um, is being intimidated maybe by a um, partner um, to take out debt that they're not going to um, get anything from. So um, legal aid really wanted to protect these people who are in this bad situation with this debt that they were forced to take out. and. They wanted to apply it to all types of debt. Um, so Teresa and I did an awful lot of work to limit the scope of this bill uh, to unsecured debt only. Um, they really wanted it to apply to car debt as well, but so it's just unsecured debt. So if, if this person who has coerced debt um, doesn't think they should have to pay it, the statute would allow them to do that. So what they have to do is they, um, must notify the debtor and provide documentation that their debt was coerced. And then, I'm sorry, they have to notify the creditor. And then the debtor will look at the information and decide within 30 days and let the person know of their decision to either stop collections or if they're going to continue collections because they don't think maybe that it is coerced debt. So if the creditor doesn't agree to stop collections, then the person claiming that the debt is coerced may bring a court action and they have to show by a preponderance of the evidence that the debt was coerced. Um, so the court could then issue an order preventing collection of the debt. A part that we added to this is that if the court does that, they're also going to award a judgment against the person who forced the debtor to take out the debt. So the bank will have someone they can try to collect from at least. Um, and then the bill it was going to be retroactive and uh, we changed that to a uh, January 1st, 2024. So debt incurred after that date, this new law would apply. Not great, but I think Teresa mentioned what the climate was like. And I think we did a lot with that to make it a little more palatable. Um, there is some payday loan language that passed um, for very small loans of less than $350. Uh, most banks I've talked to do not make those loans, but they put in an APR cap of um, 50%. It used to be you could charge a certain um, amount of fees, but now they've changed it to an APR. They did not understand the difference between an interest rate and an APR. So there is an APR cap of 50%, um, but if you charge more than 36%, then there has there's an ability to repay analysis that a lender would have to go through. This isn't aimed at banks, of course, this is aimed at payday lenders, but we are, um, if we do make those small loans, we do have to comply with this. Um, the legislature created a um, new definition of a crime called organized retail theft, trying to get at shoplifting rings and those that use um, stolen card information to create counterfeit cards to purchase retail goods. So, so when someone steals someone's card information, as you know, they'll create a card and they'll put a different name on it. And this is a big problem for law enforcement because when they arrest someone who has these cards, the name on it is not the name of the victim and they have to have the name of a victim to charge for the crime. So um, they try to get that information from financial institutions, but it sometimes takes a long time to, you know, to get a subpoena and everything. Um, and by then they have to release the person from jail and they can't charge them. So. Um, this language that passed will allow a financial institution to give the name and telephone number of the account holder without a subpoena. So the information that they will have is that that card number and they will they'll know what bank it is and then they will come to you and say, could you tell me the name and telephone number of the account holder so we can reach out to them so that we can get this person charged with this crime. Um, it is permissive. So a financial institution doesn't have to share this information, but if they do, they are protected from liability for sharing it. So uh, I think that's a positive change. Um, I think I'm gonna stop there and let Keith get going on uh, marijuana. All right, thanks Tess. Well, 
Well, let's talk about pot. All right. So big news yesterday, Walls signed the uh, the marijuana bill. So marijuana is going to be legal in the state of Minnesota. Minnesota is going to be the 23rd state where it is legal in the country. So uh, we've got some good information for this, although it's not everything in the bill because the bill is, I think, over 300 pages long. So, you know, it doesn't cover everything, but it's kind of got some highlights and everything. But, you know, always feel free to give us uh, a call or shoot us an email for any questions that you guys might have on it. But just, I think, as a good kind of background in history for this first, there's always a lot of questions that banks have on the differences between hemp and marijuana. So back in 2018, the federal government passed the Agricultural Improvement Act, which we refer to as the Farm Bill. And that's passed every four years. And that is the bill that legalized hemp, uh, the, the term hemp, by removing it from the definition of marijuana under the Controlled Substances Act. So hemp is defined as um, a cannabis plant that has 0.3% Delta 9 THC or less. And the the difference is it's kind of confusing in the Minnesota bill because they, they kind of interchange the words hemp and cannabis and marijuana in a way that doesn't totally make sense. It really should be cannabis and then under cannabis hemp and marijuana but they use cannabis interchangeably with marijuana even though hemp is under cannabis so it's just it's just makes it unnecessarily confusing but uh right now under the the federal law delta 9 and cbd are fda approved ingredients in various drugs but they couldn't be added to foods and so minnesota incorporates the minnesota's food code incorporates federal law and that was why hemp could not be added to any food product in Minnesota. So in 2022, last year, Minnesota legalized the edible cannabinoid products that we put out a lot of information about. And that was why we passed that uh, statute in Minnesota to allow uh, hemp to be added to any food products and you could have those edibles. So that's kind of just a brief, brief background and everything. But the, the important distinction is hemp versus marijuana. They are the same plant the same species of plant. The only difference that defines hemp versus marijuana is the THC content. If it's 0.3% THC or less, it is defined as hemp. If it's more than that, it's marijuana, but it's the same plant. And I'm pretty sure that the percentage will increase the longer it's flowering or something, but I'm not a farmer, so I don't understand how it works, but I, it's, it's the same plant. So people, it just is a, a legal definition that we have applied to it. So the Minnesota bill, HF 100, uh, it will take effect. So marijuana will be legal recreationally beginning August 1st. And I know some people are pretty excited about that. I'm pretty sure my neighbors have some planters set up in their uh, their backyard to begin growing this. Uh, but, you know, they got to wait until August 1st. So cannabis is legal to grow, possess, use by those 21 and over. The bill will also expunge certain cannabis offenses automatically, relatively low level ones. Uh, it will also allow others to petition this new cannabis expungement board that has been created to expunge others. And the bill will also create kind of two different businesses. There will be a hemp business, which cannot do cannabis. And then there'll be a cannabis business, which can do hemp and cannabis. And this is where the confusing part is. It should be a hemp business and a marijuana business under cannabis, but instead they're using cannabis to refer to marijuana, but that will just add to the confusion. So uh, right now the Department of Agriculture oversees hemp growers and, and will continue to do so. The bill will now create a new office of cannabis management, which is going to be overseen by a cannabis advisory council. And so under the Office of Cannabis Management, the OCM, there's going to be three divisions. There's going to be a division of medical cannabis, a division of social equity, and then a cannabis expungement board. And so the cannabis expungement board is the one who's going to be, you know, reviewing, you know, prior criminal offenses and everything. The division of social equity is going to issue grants to certain communities, and it's going to investigate any complaints that are under the bill. For personal use, people are now allowed to possess and transport all cannabis paraphernalia. People will be able to possess up to two pounds of cannabis flower, which is everything at the top part of the plant, in their home, and up to two ounces in public. So don't see anybody walking around with two pounds of marijuana in public. That's, that's too much, two ounces. You can also have up to eight grams of cannabis concentrate 
and up to 800 milligrams of THC within edibles. The use aspect is in your private home, which includes the curtilage and yard. So the curtilage is the kind of immediate area outside your home and then your, your yard. So, so not, you know, out in the middle of the street or anything. Uh, private property uh, must be not generally accessible to the public, um, but, you know, that's that's kind of what, what private property is defined as. So uh, a private property owner, like a condo or an apartment or a rental house or something, would be able to limit this somewhat. And then they could also have use for certain events and venues that will have a license for on-site consumption. As far as cultivating marijuana, Minnesota will permit people to grow, have eight plants growing at their home, but only four of them can be flowering at any one time. And the location that the plants can be in, it has to be a secured location, which really just means somewhat fenced in, uh, and it cannot be accessible or viewable to the public. So if you're walking by someone's house, or you're driving by, you just can't see it from the street. So, you know, people who have, you know, fenced in backyard, privacy fence or something like that, they would be able to be to be grown back there. But otherwise, uh, they can only have four of them flowering at a time. And that's kind of where the two pounds comes in, because essentially each plant will yield about a half a pound when flowering. So if you have four that are flowering per time, that's really kind of how you get to two pounds. You know, you know, some some will have more, some will have less, something like that. But generally speaking, that that's how they get to the two pound calculation. Uh, the bill also will allow you to gift. Gift is the important word here. Two ounces of the flour, eight grams of the concentrate, and eight hundred milligrams of THC within the edibles. But it doesn't say how often you can gift. So, I mean, that could be kind of a loophole. I mean, you could just be gifting it to, you know, if you have too much growing, you could be gifting it to many different people all the same day, different days. It, it just doesn't limit how often you can make a gift to somebody, but you cannot sell it for, for money. You can only gift it away. As far as crimes are concerned, so possessing anything over those limits, anything over two pounds, two ounces in public, the, the concentrate, 800 milligrams in edibles, anything over that is a crime. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's, it's still illegal to have anything over that. But the Minnesota, I'm pretty sure with that amount is the highest, I think, of any state uh, in terms of how much you can actually have. So two pounds, I mean, that, I don't even know how big of a cube that is, but I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a large, a large quantity. You also cannot have an open package of cannabis in your car uh, within reach of the person driving. So it's kind of going to be like an open container law where you, if you have an open package of it, it would be placed in the trunk or out of the reach of the driver or something. The expungements, there is going to be, like I said earlier, the automatic expungements, and then there's going to be ones that are, you know, otherwise expunged or resentenced. So basically misdemeanor offenses, those are just going to be again uh, to be automatically expunged beginning August 1st. And then the felony level criminal cases will be reviewed on a case by case basis. So they'll they'll think of it in terms of you know public interest. Uh, and you know an example might be if somebody had a prior felony conviction where they had marijuana possession and there was another crime involved or there was a weapon involved. So any of those sort of aggravating circumstances might not allow the crime to be expunged, but otherwise those those low level offenses are all just pretty much going to go away. So cannabis businesses, uh, this is where it gets kind of interesting. So they the bill will not allow businesses to vertically integrate the entire process from growing to retailing and distributing and everything. There's going to be about 16 categories of licenses that will allow companies to do various things, you know, whether you're a grower or a retailer or something like that or a processor. And you can you can combine a couple of them. If you are going to be you know a retailer, you might be able to get a license to have some on-site consumption, all that sort of stuff. But you cannot get all of the endorsements so that they don't want to have one of the big businesses that come in and take over every step of the process. And then depending on the license that you get, the fee for the for the application is going to range from anywhere between two hundred fifty dollars to ten thousand uh, dollars. The initial 
that's for the just for the application fee then the initial license fee is going to be anywhere between zero dollars to ten thousand dollars and then the renewal fee is going to be anywhere between zero dollars and seventy thousand dollars so the medical cannabis one is the one that has the highest fee that's the seventy thousand dollar one and um you know having having one license kind of essentially will make you ineligible for a lot of the other ones but you know it, it, it we, we we're not totally clear yet on which ones the, those exactly are but that would be something that your customers would have to figure out with their own attorney in, in, in any case and there is a carve out in here so on the, on the cannabis side um a micro business license it will be one of them and that will allow somebody to have a canopy size of 500 square feet per store and then there will be a meso business license which will allow somebody to have up to 15,000 square feet in three stores and then the medical cannabis license will allow up to um let's see 60,000 square feet as long as half of that goes to medical products but again that's the one that has the $70,000 renewal fee so that one's quite expensive and there will be so the limits on the licenses uh, are going to apply to all managers directors and general partners of a business licensee so if you have people who are operating different businesses they also are going to limit this from you know you have one entity that's operating as a retailer and you got one entity that might be operating as you know a processor grower or something like that they are going to to make sure that the the licensee the license limit attaches to all those people that are kind of really operating the business and another another part is the the tax deductions that go along with this because it's still illegal at the federal level and you can't uh deduct a lot of the expenses that go along with these businesses from from taxes so that adds to a lot of expense for these businesses a hemp business a hemp business as i said earlier can only do hemp so this is going to be right now a lot of the the bars and the restaurants and the, the liquor stores that can sell these lower potency hemp edible products on sites so even on tap right now some of them can't do it on tap but then they will allow actual tap to uh, actually have the uh, these hemp products in there uh, as long as they have the proper endorsement that one though doesn't have a cap on their integration limits so they could really i suppose be growing it and then putting it in there processing it and everything like that and it's got lower lower applications lower license fees um, this one is permissible to have interstate commerce between the the businesses so because hemp is legal at the federal level it allows interstate commerce the cannabis or the, the marijuana is illegal federally so they they don't have interstate commerce uh, allowed for that and then there's uh, a lower potency edible term that is a that is going to take in take effect here so right now uh as i said earlier there's the edible cannabinoid products and that is still going to have a still apply there's going to be a sunset period and it's going to be replaced with what's going to be called the lower potency hemp edibles and if you have any businesses that are making and selling these edible cannabinoid products they need to register with the commissioner of health by October 1st of this year, October 1st, 2023, you need to register to continue selling those products and then they'll be able to sell those products until March 1st of 2025. So the edible cannabinoid uh, manufacturers and retailers are, are not uh, hemp businesses under the statute. So the, another, another important thing about that is the Edible cannabinoid product beverages are going to be limited to two servings per package, and the law states that the edible cannabinoid products can be served on site by a business that holds an on sale liquor license. So Department of Agriculture is going to continue licensing the hemp growers and will continue to license the hemp processors until March 1st, 2025. At which point the lower potency hemp edible licensing regime is going to take over and it's kind of confusing we're confused on it everybody's confused on it so that uh, is is something that we're going to have some more information about in, in the future let's see so next one the medical businesses so the medical cannabis business has been legal in minnesota for a while um legal in, in many many states so that is going to be transferred from the Minnesota Department of Health, which currently oversees it, to the Medical Cannabis 
division in OCM. So they're just going to change over uh, to that division to be responsible for it. So there's going to be licenses for medical cannabis cultivators, medical cannabis processors, medical cannabis retailers, and then a combined medical cannabis combination license. So that will allow recreational and medical cannabis. And that was where I said about earlier about the 60,000 square foot canopy, half of it has to go to medical. And that was the one that has the $70,000 renewal license. So that's sort of the, the, the big one, because that allows you really to do everything. And that is the medical cannabis is, isn't subject to the 10% gross receipts tax that's going to apply to any of the medical or sorry, any of the recreational cannabis. So the, there's a 10% tax attached to it, but that won't apply to the medical side. And that is also going to be effective March 1st, 2025 for the, for the medical business ones. The license and application, it, it, it's going to have seven categories that are going to be considered for this. Uh, one, of the, one of the categories that makes up 20% of the application points is the social equity applicant. So the social equity test is going to apply to every single owner of the business. So you can't just have five partners and then one of them meets the social equity uh, test. It has to be every single person who owns the business. Uh, there's going to be, you know, points will be, you know, awarded to, or sorry, some of the other categories that are considered are, are veteran status or retired National Guard, anything like that. Let's, they are also going to look at security and record keeping requirements around the business, employee training that's provided, business plan, financial situation. Obviously, they're going to look at that in terms of the application prior labor and employment practices and future labor and employment practices, and then just general knowledge and experience in the industry. The, the big part though, the social equity criteria that I mentioned, so there's there's really kind of seven categories of people. There's um, people with prior convictions, family members, uh, people with, who have family members who have had prior convictions, dependents of somebody who has had a prior conviction, dishonorably discharged vets or dis discharged vets with other than honorable status, I believe. I don't think it's dishonorably discharged. It's discharged with other than honorable status. That's another category. Um, resident, somebody who lived within just a general area for five or more years that had disproportionate cannabis enforcement in that, that area that they'll define. A emerging farmer, a resident also within five years or more in a census tract that has a certain minimum poverty rate. So those are going to be the people that essentially would score the highest on the social equity aspect of their application. And again, that has to be for every single partner in the business would have to meet that and there is a carve out, though, for applicants that can show how somehow how cannabis, the illegality of cannabis has negatively impacted their life. I, I don't know what that means, but it, it a, that, that's probably imagine, I imagine for people who have some sort of medical requirement that they could say that, you know, having the inability to acquire marijuana has made it difficult to manage their health concerns and everything. I could see it being a carve out for those people as well. But that's pretty much a high level overview right now, the bill and kind of the, the important things in there that, uh, that has come up. So, you know, I think right now, if you have those, those businesses that are account holders and they are selling those, uh, any of the edible cannabinoid products, they should uh, register with um, the, the department before uh, October of this year and then continue selling those products. And then the Office of Cannabis Management, I don't think it opens until maybe next year. Um, and, you know, they, they still have to I say hire people and everything, uh, but, you know, that'll be, that'll be a little bit time. So we're not going to see a bunch of marijuana businesses probably open here um, August 1st. I doubt it. So right now it's just going to be people, you know, growing it themselves. But small towns, I think, are going to be allowed to limit it to one retailer. I, I'm not sure what the population is going to be for that, but a small town is also going to be able to, to limit how many people or how many businesses that they could have that are that are selling these if they want to. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, uh, it's it's a really long bill. So there's a lot of information in there. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take a deeper dive, more detailed look for our legislative summary. So um, I mentioned that earlier. I think Teresa did too. But 
we'll be putting out something in the summer that covers this and all the other bills that we mentioned in more detail. Um, also, the MBA is going to be working on a class on banking cannabis businesses. Um, and we have heard from the Department of Commerce that they will be providing guidance also on, on banking these businesses. So there will be information out there. But as Keith said, these, these businesses won't be open and running anytime soon. Um, and Cass, but we will have those resources. Hmm? So just one, a couple of things also on that is just on the legislative side of things. One of the important things that happened in the tax committee was we had talked to the Department of Commerce and we had talked to the tax chair, or we had talked to the commerce chair, we had, which was also the author of the bill, Zach Stevenson. Because um, many of time during session, we re, you know we continue to let them know that you know it still needs to be dealt with at the, fed, at the federal level, which you know is another whole conversation about the Safe Banking Act that's happening. At, you know, that's hopefully going to happen um, in Congress. Um, but we also kept saying, you know, it's a very highly, you know, very highly regulated industry, the financial institutions, and that to not expect that on day one that there's going to be banks that are able to be up and running, running and taking on these businesses. Um, and they kept saying, you know, we look at, you know, we look at Colorado, we look at all these other states and what they have. And I said, yes, I said, but that's 10 years later. I said, do not expect on day one that there's going to be, you know, these overflowing, you know, institutions that are ready to go. Um, which also then went to the tax part of it because you know most tax you know if you pay your taxes taxes cannot be paid in cash, um, and we said to both the Department of Commerce and also to the Commerce and author of this bill, which is that the Department of Revenue should be ready to accept cash that there is no guarantee that they're going to get payment in any other system other than cash, um, so that there was language in there that. Um, would allow that any tax revenue needs that can be paid in cash to the Department of Revenue um, until, you know, because again, you can't put a time limit on this. And I will say Representative Farr also spoke on the floor on this one as well. And kind of, and this raised, you know, a lot of concerns were raised on the banking side of it. But as we know, you know, Minnesota being the 23rd state when it comes to this, banking is not going to stop, you know, was never going to stop marijuana getting through. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that they were well aware and didn't come back to us later and say, why don't we have an institution that we can put all these funds into? We want to make sure that they are well aware that, you know, it's a very risky business and there's a lot more that needs to go into it. Um, and it's just, you know, and banks think things through and they think all the risks through. So to not just expect that it's going to happen, you know, easily on day one. So those are my two comments. Thanks, Teresa. Tom, we left you a couple minutes if you want to talk about... Um... <laughs> That mortgage issue. Yes, oops. Let me turn on. There we go. Turn on my video. Uh, yes, kind of dealing with the golden oldie question uh, that we get all the time uh, about what's a refinance, a new transaction as opposed to modification, renewal, extension. And unfortunately, a state law, there's not uh, there's not too many bright line uh, distinctions, but uh, one of them, it's a good rule of thumb, is if you're moving from a closed end. To an open-end product, that would be something considered a, a refinance and a new transaction. Um, otherwise, you're looking at the totality of the circumstances. Um, you know, it's kind of it's fairly well established, at least, that if you're merely do uh, merely updating the interest rate to the current uh, interest, you know, prevailing interest rate, and then making a an adjustment to payments to incorporate that interest rate change. Uh, that's not going to be something that by itself would make something a refinance as opposed to a modification or an extension of the transaction. Uh, so you really have to look at what other things you're changing. If you know your payment schedule is changing, uh, the term is changing. You know, if you before you were going on a five-year term every time, and now you're going to maybe three. You know, along with these other changes, uh, that's something that could lead to where you have a refinance as opposed to. Uh, um, uh, modification or extension, you know, if you're if you're swapping out collateral, that kind of stuff, all these sort, sort of things. You, the more changes you make, uh, the more likely are you are to have a refinance and and therefore a new transaction. Uh, and even if you are doing just a modification or an extension, uh, if you're changing anything as far as the payment schedule or the interest rate, or you're imposing a fee when you do that, uh, it's good to give disclosures to the consumers. Uh, so they're aware of how that impacts their their credit re repayment and their credit transaction. Hey Tom, there's a, a question about a commercial or ag loan. They're asking, can you do a modification to add a prepayment penalty? 
You know, that's a good question. I haven't seen a, that specifically addressed. Um, if that's the only thing that's changing, maybe that would be, maybe that would be um, uh, okay. If it's again, it's you're kind of pulling out the scales and determining how much you're changing the the nature of the transaction. Uh, so if that change alone, you know, as long as it's permissible uh, under the statutes, uh, I think with that would be fine, but I haven't seen anything that's addressed that uh, directly. So again, this is where you get in the vagaries of the state law and yeah. what's exactly permitted and what's not. I just haven't seen it directly I worry addressed. about that. Don't you think, you know, it's a, it's a modification of a contract really. Mm -hmm. And where's the consideration for that modification on the one side, right? That's a good point. If you change, yeah. It. Usually, what they when they when they write in those modification agreements, they have that kind of nebulous, uh, generally in in exchange for, you know, essentially continuing with the credit relationship, uh, that specific credit relationship. Uh, that's uh, in large part the the the, the uh, consideration for making okay. the change. Yeah, um, that makes sense. So presumably, you're adding the prepayment penalty because something has happened earlier in the credit relationship that makes you worry about that. Or I suppose it could be other credit relationships that they take out a, um, a bunch of loans and they continually repay them uh, off early. Um, but yeah, I just, I haven't seen it directly addressed. But yeah, consideration is always an issue. You have to have that addressed in, in your uh, modification agreement. Um, I was going to say with that that question for that when you can, if they could do that. I mean, the, the the concern isn't so much you know can you do this, can you do that, can you do this. It's the fact that you're changing something that they're they're modifying whatever it is that you're modifying. You know, it's, that you have your your contracts, so you're changing it. That's you know, it doesn't matter what it is. You're you're making some change to this, and so the big question is going to be whether or not it's it's a refi versus a modification rather than well, what if we add the delinquency penalty or prepayment penalty or whatever it is. So it's not not just per thing that you're doing uh, that makes yeah. it permissible or not. So another uh, question, the other question about commercial ag. Yeah. yeah. Changing that. I mean, if you do change open end to closed end, I mean, there's a question between the documentation and whether or not it's a new transaction. So uh, I think as far as doing a modification documents to affect that change, that I think you could do that, you know, work with an attorney to, to get the language correct. But if you're going from open end to closed end or the reverse, I think you have a new transaction, even on the commercial ag side. So we're dealing with that uh, variable to fixed. You know, I certainly lean the the uh, uh, the same way that it would be a new transaction, but something you could likely, um, you know, affect through a modification document rather than having all new all new documentation. But uh, again, when you get to that point, you you really want to make sure you're working with an attorney to make sure that your your documentation is accurate and does everything it needs to do. Um, you know, you might have some limitations on just your documentation system that's coming out of your your regular lending software. They may not truly um, support uh, that kind of change through a, through a modification agreement. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, just a reminder, we're here to answer questions for you on legal and compliance issues. You can email at legal at minbankers.com or give us a call. Um, Look for our legislative summary to come out to cover everything that we've talked about today. There should be a legal compliance bulletin on the case that I discussed. Um, and also look for a class on banking cannabis businesses. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you have a great rest of the day. Bye.